Okay, so we're going to take questions and topics for the panel, but I'll get us started out. Uh, so, um, it's um, so I, I, th I think we can start by uh, by asking, uh, what do you worry about? What do you think is the most important unsolved problem that maybe that nobody is working on in this area? Sparse uh, databases, uh, tensor algebra, or uh, graphs, and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I, I don't think that nobody is working on them. I think, you know, some of the things I mentioned, I know, you know, uh, some of these abs abstractions, I know Willow's been working on, Olivia's been doing some of this stuff. So it's not that nobody's working on it, but um, I do worry uh, a little bit about whether the world is actually sparse and whether <laughs> we just <laughs> we just need to find a mapping to uh, denseness. Um, but, uh, yeah, honestly, for me, the biggest worry is just we have great research, but we have very few ways to apply that research to practical problems. And that is, for me, as somebody in, in an industrial research lab, it's, it's kind of a nightmare because there's so many times where I'm like, I know the answer to that. And, you know, we don't, um, we don't have a good way of doing that. And, you know, I'll, I'll, and in terms of like impact, what practicality can have, you know, one of the biggest, speaking of attention, one of the biggest things in for attention was this, this uh, library called Flash Attention, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, but Flash Attention is really the tiling that Saman teaches in, you know, the first parallel programming course. That gets you like a huge percentage of the performance gain, right? It's not all of it. It's like the memory bandwidth savings really comes from that, but from tiling, not unnecessarily reloading data. Um, so the gap between like what we know and what we can actually use, that is, is something that I find worrying. I, yeah, I, I would uh, maybe try and translate some of what Teo said, um, <laughs> and and I, this is something I would differ with Shwebe about. And I was about to say is that it's not just the simple tiling because you need to exploit algebraic properties of transcendental <laughs> function to do this rewrite. This is like well outside of the realm of what most of these compilers are going to do. It's not a very complicated transformation uh, mathematically, but it's essential. And so you had to have a more integrated uh, view. Halide would say, oh, well, you're changing the algorithm, but you're changing the algorithm in a way that couples to um, the, uh, the scheduling. Um, and they're not independently separated in that case in the way that it's intended for them to be. Uh, that's a really interesting challenge, I think, in general, um, and may be much more prevalent in sparse stuff, and maybe to connect that to Simon's talk, the fact that for sparse computing, I mean, Halide sort of had this for image processing reasons, but sparse computations are much more likely to be bandwidth bound. And so the benefits of fusing multiple sparse computations together is much higher and much more important to handle. So let me answer that question, uh, take a little bit of a different angle in here. Uh, for 50 plus years, the best data structures we get performance were dense arrays on integer grids. So what that means is the application community has calcified on that as a method to get their results. So right now, how do you get these application people to go to the first principles and say, okay, if we give you this different uh, set of primitives that's as 
performant or close to as performant as dense, can you redo the problem? The problem is you have to probably go a couple of generations of these people before because for many people, the way they do things today are kind of the, it's, th it's a religion, I I it's a given. And, and I don't know enough of the uh, math and the domains to try to undo that. Saying, okay, okay, no, 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 don't look at this. Why are you using this kind of a thing? I think part of that is we bring these new things. Are we too late to the game? Uh, should I, if we have bought it like uh, 30 years ago, then when they st first start using it, they had those tools, they would have gone a different path. Uh, have we, in many of these things, are we stuck in a local minima and how do you get out of it? Just curious, what uh, what your take on uh, sparsity exploitation in hardware is? So um, uh, I guess starting at A one hundred, they added this clipping of four values to two. You have FPGAs and other things, and they are low and upper bounds are even much harder because you can arbitrarily replicate certain circuits. So so what's your take on that? Okay, let me take that question because. My entire life doing a compiler person, I always get this hardware people saying, I have this new VSBank thing, would you take advantage? I'm like, no, just give me a vector machine, I'll be happy. <laughs> uh, the for the first time, I feel that there's a use of hardware. Because right now what happens is, we bring all this data to memory without understanding what data is, to throw out most of it. Okay, So earlier we understand what this data is, and do that filtering, I think we'll have a huge benefit in here because most of the sparse computations is basically, that's why we can't take advantage of because uh, if you do sparse matrix, sparse matrix multiply, uh, we have to bring up the entire damn matrices in, we d whereas 99% of that will be not used. Uh, the part of that, the hard part is hardware for the most part, until the data arrives way into the process, data is opaque. You are just drinking data as just bits, bringing it there. You need to propagate the knowledge what data is, the representation downstream all the way to memory, even to the way ma the data st stored in there. If we can do that, I think for sparsity, I think we'll get huge benefits in that. So on, on the relevance of the lower bound and upper bound thinking, I think uh, this question about, well, I'm going to change the hardware is great, because I gave the talk from the perspective of someone writing the low-level software. Um, but if you talk with architects, figuring out things like roofline models and the limits of what you can do is extraordinarily important. So you could think about, I have some particular piece of hardware. Have I maxed out the software or not yet? Once I max out the software, what are those lower bounds which are limits? Great, you just identified the most important things to address in your new architecture. Um, if you don't have some kind of map, conceptual map of these things, then you end up thrashing a ton, and it's hard to prioritize which uh, parts of the architecture need addressing. So I think it's even more important uh, and more complicated in a way uh, to handle these things in hardware. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, to show it, actually, uh, the, the point that you mentioned about the light moment, actually, for the sparse word. So, uh, so can, you, can you give somehow more details, actually, why, wh what, what do you think would take, actually, to bring the, the sparse tensor compiler word, actually, to the robustness of uh, what we have, actually, right now in the, in the dense word? So, I want to give a hypothesis, I'm not sure whether you would agree or not. So. I think that, for example, halide, it was based on the array abstraction. Perhaps could we say that, dense array abstraction, could we say that the one, one of the reasons that we cannot see the robustness for the sparse word is because perhaps the dense array abstraction, the array abstraction is not the right level of abstraction for that word. So it's interesting that I don't see halide as having arrays at all, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm. It's I, I can see why people think that, but in Halide, really, like what you have is an infinite space. 
multi-dimensional space, right? Um, indexed, as Simon points out, by integers, but it's not physically backed by an array. Um, and that's part of what makes the it possible to transform these computations kind of more robustly. But that I'm, I'm dodging your question by concentrating on that. Um, I think for me, the, the thing that I pointed out here was that there was a driving set of applications and hardware, right? So you had on the Pixel phone a very early DSP on the Qualcomm chip um, that was maybe Saman's ideal machine. It was a very large vector machine um, with the weirdest instruction set I've ever seen, right? Um, programming that was really difficult, but you could get really good performance um, with very little energy. So the hardware was sitting there to be exploited, right? People were hand coding imaging pipelines on that hardware. Um, at the same time, you had an application area that really needed to use that hardware. Um, the early Pixel phones, the um, Google Glass, the battery was so minuscule, the efficiency was so bad that you really, really needed, for this kind of application, you need kind of almost real time performance, right? So I think like the convergence of both, of, of three things really was there. There was the hardware was waiting to be exploited, there was the application area, and there was a partially written and somewhat working compiler, right? And at the center of that, there was a person motivated to make it all work. So, I, you know, in terms of sparse computation, like, I really do think for the tensor compiler stuff, taking, we can take maybe that the lowering algorithm is, in fact, correct. Let's take that as an assumption. S Saman assures me that's the case and he has proof. Um, that's one building block, right? But we still need kind of the other pieces and I think application areas I pointed out are here. The hardware is also kind of here, I think, as, as you were pointing out. The thing, the place where we are right now is we have to maybe maximize our exploitation of the dense hardware as much as we can in order to prove to hardware manufacturers that, hey, you actually need to add this other piece. And I've heard willingness from manufacturers. M maybe they're just telling me that because they like Adobe or something, but I've heard this willingness. Um, but I, I think we're not there yet. We're not hitting those bounds um, in a way that convinces hardware designers. Yeah, I'll add to that. I think if you look at hardware today, uh, they don't uh, believe in what compilers can do. And one so what they have done is build some very simple built-in, okay, I just need to get SPMV or SPMM. I'll build that. Oh, yeah, I can only do this one, two formats. That's all that matters. So, uh, I mean, there's good precedence for hardware. People do not believe in compilers. But that said, uh, like, Okay, we don't want Itanium uh, uh, example again coming in here, but uh, if you don't give flexibility, either they are very smart and, and just build something that works on one application, or they do something stupid and build this, this architecture nobody can use, but there's flexibility hidden inside that compilers can do that. But I think they are getting smart and they are trying to build this like very domain-specific one algorithm accelerators. And that's going to kind of really reduce the compiler's ability to kind of expand around. So I want to find a couple of dumb architects who will build something that has all this power hidden that uh, can't take advantage of. Um, so w one I sort of along with the lines of Saman said, an interesting thing on flexibility versus optimizing for one problem is uh, NVIDIA's continued success for machine learning workloads over, say, uh, TPUs and the various sorts of custom accelerators. Those uh, 
are really focused on the matrix multiplication, and it can be really difficult to incorporate other computations in around it, and that's been, you know, sort of the death knell for them. Uh, so it's sort of weird. You have to account for two different things. I think this applies for anything with sparsity as well. You need to have the common case, which is going to be the bulk of the computation, run as fast as possible, and you need to also not completely have a performance cliff on everything else. Uh, and that's hard to do. And that that's from the system perspective, not just the hardware, not just the compiler. Um. Okay, let's... I, I, and, I, and I will say, like, in this, the other piece of it is really the hardware-software interface. Like, for example, if there's anybody from ARM, I'm sorry I'm about to say this, but, like, SVE is insanely difficult to use and program for, right? Um, to the extent that I think one of the biggest ARM manufacturers has SME, and not SVE, but then you have this other problem, which is that how do you take your met matrix outputs and, and use vector instructions on them, and there, so there's streaming SVE. So there's all these like different places where, as Saman says, the hardware manufacturers don't trust compilers, but that leads to bad designs <laughs> also, right? So I think that there is somewhere here where um, where they're a middle ground between having instructions that are very specific for this one specific operation, matrix multiply, versus having more flexibility as building blocks. I think the other thing with those, wh where hardware manufacturers are going, is that we're not allowed to program a lot of these functional units, right? They're completely hidden behind opaque APIs. so. There's something to be overcome here in that aspect also that did not exist at the time Halide was there, mostly because DSPs were coming from a different domain and were being like repurposed for uh, the specific image processing domain. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, let's do a closing statement quick mm -hmm. uh, thing if you want to end on a word. Okay, um, I, I'm just going to repeat what I said from the talk is, you know, can, can we max some things out and know that we max them out? Uh, I think that's a really important problem. Um, and I think it would drive a lot of progress. Uh, it, it makes it where you can't lie to yourself in your eval a little bit more, right? Uh, which I think is a good thing and would push the community forward. So it's interesting that we have come this far in programming languages and you look at a company like NVIDIA, why it's success? Because they have a horde of engineers who were able to take these codes and, and write it in very low level. In fact, Jensen gave this uh, keynote address uh, in a uh, keynote or uh, I think uh, commencement speak and they said his biggest contributions they have made to the world is CUDA saying they made this language that makes it possible to take advantage. I'm like, damn, from programming languages point, that means we have failed. You have to go to all these, like the next level assembly language to get performance. So I think uh, uh, sparsity is this one of those interesting areas where uh, it's not simple to get to that performance in there. And we are still struggling in dense, but, but this is harder. So I think there's a good opportunity to make it in a way that that you don't end up being like the the next level CUDA that you have to write all these things low level by hand going forward to get performance. Um, I just want our software to work, so <laughs> that's what I'm going to leave us with.